Thank you for listening to the show on Really Big Something Channel. September 11th, 2017. 105 here on the great WRKO. Okay, my friends, we're definitely going to talk about the 16th, uh, the 16 year anniversary of the 9 11 attacks. We'll do that in the next hour. But this hour may be one of the most important hours of radio I have done in a long time. An incredible, riveting, absolutely riveting interview with the former chief strategist of Trump. Uh, Steve Bannon, as you know, he essentially resigned after serving one year under the president. And uh, in an interview with Charlie Rose on 60 Minutes, it was, first of all, incredibly entertaining. I don't know if many of you saw it or not, but it was highly engaging, extremely entertaining, very profoundly insightful. And Bannon, as you know, is a former investment banker. He was also in Hollywood for a while. He's the founder of Breitbart News and in many ways the chief strategist who helped Trump turn around his campaign and achieve the miracle that was his election victory in November. Bannon is an Irish Catholic. It's going to be very important to understand this when you go through some of the clips. We're going to play them for you during this hour. He's a proud American. He's also Irish and he's a proud Catholic. And it's now come out that CBS, it now appears, was deliberately playing with the colors on his face to try to make him seem more evil and more sinister. You could sense the hostility from Charlie Rose throughout the entire interview. They hate him. The media loathes him. The uh, media class can't stand him. He is persona non grata, outside of the president himself, public enemy number one. And so listen now to Bannon. Uh, there's so much to unpack here, but let me just start off with this. Listen now to Bannon. Openly admit that the Republican establishment, led by McConnell and Ryan, from day one have been seeking to nullify the election and block Trump's populist agenda. Listen to Bannon. Take it straight to Mitch McConnell. Roll it, Brittany. The Republican establishment is trying to nullify the 2016 election. That's a brutal fact we have to face. The Republican establishment. The Republican establishment is wants trying to nullify the 2016 election. Trying to nullify the 2016 election. Right. Absolutely. Who? I think, I think Mitch McConnell to a degree, Paul Ryan. They do not want Donald Trump's populist, economic, nationalist agenda to be implemented. It's very obvious. It's obvious as, it's obvious as, it's obvious as night follows day. Give me a story that mean. illustrates that. Well, Mitch McConnell, we first met him. I mean, he, was, he, was, he, he said, I think, in one of the first meetings uh, in Trump Tower with the president, uh, as we're wrapping up, he basically says, I don't want to hear any more of this drain the swamp talk. He says, I can't, can't hire any smart people because everybody's all over him for reporting requirements and, and the pay, etc., in the scrutiny. You know, you've got to back off that. The drain the swamp thing was, was Mitch McConnell was day one. Did not want to go there, wanted us to back off. Bingo. I mean, to me, when I'm, I'm like, we all know this. I understand, you know, I know it, you know it. But it's now officially been confirmed. The moment the guy won... There's McConnell. Hey, whoa, 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 whoa. What do you mean? What do you mean drain the swamp? What do you mean you're going to stop the corruption? Whoa, whoa. I can't, I, I can't get people on my staff. Then the, the, there's higher levels of scrutiny now. Accountability. What's the matter with you? You're going to kill us up here in Washington. You can't do this. And then Bannon, I think, th hit the nail on the head. And Grace and I both looked at each other when he said, when he made this point, about Washington, D.C. becoming a business model. And Grace and I both, because we you know we were there for 10 years, and we both pointed to each other like, he just freaking nailed it. What's going on in Washington, as Bannon rightly says in the interview, is that it is the most successful business model in world history. And by this I mean not that they're producing a good product. In fact, it's the opposite. They're, they're producing a garbage product. 
but it's making them trillions of dollars. And in particular, as he put it, the business model is this. The donor class, the political consultants, the K Street lobbyists, and the politicians. It's a vast, all-powerful, incredibly, almost mind-bogglingly lucrative network whereby for the past 50 years, they have made not billions, not tens of billions, but literally trillions of dollars. Now, when you're talking trillions of dollars, forget Microsoft, forget Jeff Bezos and Amazon, forget Zuckerberg and Facebook, that is more money, forget Bill Gates, that is more money than these people could even dream of. And so as Bannon laid out, as he's criticizing, Charlie Rose like, well, you guys didn't drain the swamp. And Bannon, right, he goes, look, he's only been in power for eight months. This business model has been in place for 50 years. And as Bannon rightly put it, it's not, two terms won't be enough to drain this swamp. It's going to take 20 years to drain this swamp. Because this thing was built over 50 years. And there are so many powerful vested interests they will not allow or they will seek to not allow this president to succeed and then one of the most interesting points that he mentioned was the infamous billy bush tape you know where trump was caught basically i grab him by the pee and so forth and you know basically locker room talk and of course then, the media went wild with it. They thought they had their president. They thought they had Hillary in the White House, and they thought they had now finally decisively cut Trump's political throat. Listen now to Bannon describe how when the politicians walked in to a man and woman, all they do is cater to the media. All they do is live in fear of the media. And the number one Judas was none other than Reince Priebus. Roll it, Brittany. And, and Trump went around the room and asked people the percentages he thought of, of still winning and what the recommendation. And Reince started off and Reince said, you have, uh, you have two choices. You either drop out right now or you lose by the biggest landslide in American political history. <laughs> and Trump, with his humor, goes, that's a great way, that's a great way to start our, start our conversation. We went around the room. And you could tell, I could tell from the incoming of politicians, and I could tell from some of the politicians that were there, is that the natural inclination of politicians are, are, are to be so overwhelmingly um, uh, stunned and shocked by how the media comes on you. But Trump wasn't that. And I told him as he went around, I was the last guy to speak, and I said, it's 100%. You have 100% probability of winning. And that's the first time... Well, you seem to have done that at every point in the campaign. When he was in trouble, asking him to double down on his rhetoric, double down in terms of appealing to his base appealing to the american people and to the working class people in this country absolutely you know why because it was a winner that's why i told him double down every time and on that day that's the first time and only time we ever got upset when he goes come on it's not a hundred come on it's not a hundred percent i go it's absolutely hundred percent and i told him why they don't care and they do care about respect for women they, they do, do they do but they, but they but and it's not just locker room talk i mean it's locker it, room talk the billy bush thing is locker room talk bingo and remember, I was saying it for months. I was one of the few people in the media. I go, he's going to win. He's going to win. I'm telling you, he's going to win. Because his America First agenda is exactly what the country wanted, what the country craved, and what the country needed. But notice, from the beginning, you have Reince Priebus. Well, you've got two options. Either you resign or you're going to get wiped out in the biggest political landslide defeat in American history. They never believed in him. His people around him never really believed in him. And then the question's always been, how come Trump never offered a cabinet position to Chris Christie? You want to know why? <laughs> Listen to more, Bannon. Roll it, Brittany. Did you lose confidence of anybody because they came at you at that point and said, look, we, we, he ought to get out of this race other than Reince Priebus? I mean, did your attitude towards those people who said that you're just wrong? Absolutely. Billy Bush Saturday, to me, is a litmus test. It's a litmus test. And I said it the other day to General Kelly during the Charlottesville thing afterwards. It's a, it's a line I remember from the movie The Wild Bunch. William Holden uses it right before that huge gunfight at the end. 
When you side with a man, you side with him. Okay? The good and the bad. You can criticize him behind, but when you side with him, you have to side with him. And that's what Billy Bush Weekend showed me. Morning well, shows. you took names on Billy Bush Sunday, didn't you? I did. Uh, I got him. I got it. You know, I'm Irish. I got, I got my black book and I got him. Christy, because of uh, Billy Bush uh, Weekend, uh, and, uh, was, uh, was uh, not looked as for a cabinet position. He wasn't there for you on Billy Bush Weekend, so therefore he doesn't get a cabinet position. I told him the plane leaves at 11 o'clock in the morning. If you're on the plane, you're on the team. Didn't make the plane. He thought Trump was a loser. Chris Christie thought, no way, Trump can't win. The Billy Bush tape sunk him. And I want nothing to do with him. The guy's toxic. And so Christie said, you know, blank you. <laughs> you're saying, I'm not going on that plane. I'm not going to be seen with you. You're going down. You're going down in flames. And so as Bannon said, I'm Irish. He goes, and I have my black book. And I put people in my black book. And he was one of the guys in my black book. And I told the president, no way. Don't put that Judas in the cabinet. And by the way, Bannon is completely right. Completely right. Because that showed who were his true friends, his true allies, his true loyalists, and those that were just in it to get a position for themselves. Now, there's a, believe me, there's so much to unpackage. To me, there is one cut in particular, and I'm going to play it very shortly, that the media has not noticed. I don't think anybody else has really picked up on. It's by far, there's some really sexy, you know, politically sexy lines that he throws out. Very provocative stuff. This one, it's almost just kind of buried in the interview. But I think it's incredibly revealing about Bannon, about Trump, about everybody around him. And I think it, it explains so much of why he's found it so difficult, the president has, to really get his agenda done. It's an incredibly... It's almost as if Bannon let his guard down and didn't quite realize he let his guard down. Roll it, Brittany. In the 48 hours after we won, there's a fundamental decision that was made. You might call it the original sin of the administration. We embraced the establishment. I mean, we totally embraced the establishment. I think in President Trump's mind, or President like Trump's mind, and in Jared's mind, in the family's mind, I actually agreed with the decision. Because you had to stand for government. And, and, and to be brutally frank, you know, the, the, the campaign, look, I've never been in a campaign in my entire life, right? You know, I'm, I'm a, a former investment banker as a media guy running a, a, a little website. Um, we were, our whole campaign was a little bit the island of misfit toys. So he looks around, and I'm wearing my combat jacket, I haven't shaved, I got, you know, my hair's down to here. And he says, he's, he's thinking, hey, I've got to put together a government. I've got to really staff out something. I need to embrace the establishment. I need to govern. I need to govern. And that was the great mistake. Now, notice he says Jared really pressed it upon the president. In other words, you got to reach out to the establishment. We don't know how to govern. Even the way Bannon paints the picture. I'm in my military jacket. I haven't shaved. I got hair down basically to his neck. You know, we're political outsiders. We're, we're not the insiders. And now we've pulled off this incredible election. We've stunned the country. We've stunned the world. We've stunned the media political establishment. My God, what do we do now? And to me, let me tell you what I think is very revealing. Ultimately, they didn't believe in themselves. They didn't ultimately believe in themselves. They believed in the message. They believed in the agenda. They believed in their ideas. But they didn't believe in themselves as individuals that they themselves could govern. And so what's their instinct? Their instinct is to reach out to the political insiders, to reach out to the establishment, in some ways to reach out to the swamp. So instead of draining the swamp on day one, as Bannon rightly says it right there, he goes, that was our original sin. We tried to reach across the aisle. We tried to work with them. Because we thought, well, they know what they're doing. Ultimately, they're going to bend to the will of the American people. They know what they're doing. They know how Washington works. Ultimately, we don't because we're the outsiders. And instead, it showed to me a deep, profound insecurity. In Bannon's part, frankly, in Trump's part, in Kushner's part, and everybody around the president. He never should have reached out to the establishment.
And by the way, by the way, to me, that explains everything. It explains why he didn't fire Comey on day one. He wanted to work with Comey. It explains why he trusted Ryan and McConnell to repeal and replace Obamacare. In other words, he put the fate of his big agenda, his agenda, in their hands. He didn't want to fight with them. He wanted to work with them. It's why he didn't get rid of Reince Priebus. He wanted to get along with the Republican establishment, thinking, well, they know how to get things done. And instead, they infiltrated his administration and have been seeking to subvert and sabotage it all along. 617-266-6868. Your reaction to the Bannon interview. Don't touch that dial. But I believe you're going to see over time, he's going to have a greater appreciation that this is a city of institutions, and you must engage them as institutions. 124 here on the great RKO. Okay, an incredible interview with former chief strategist Steve Bannon. Uh, incredibly honest, uh, forthright, uh, really just you want to talk about uh, just spilling the beans. He spilled everything in that interview, or most of everything. And as Bannon laid out, he thinks Trump made a very big mistake. Is that as a businessman, you just heard a little bit of the cut, he still believes in personalities. That if you, if you get along with Comey, you can take care of the FBI. If you get along with Ryan and McConnell, you can deal with the Republicans on Capitol Hill. If you deal with Reince Priebus, you can take care of the GOP establishment. And instead, as Bannon rightly notes, the powerful institutional forces in Washington are out to destroy him. Roll it, Brittany. What I have received from you in this conversation is Donald Trump, uh, you believe, is a historic figure. You believe that Donald Trump, I mean, has been without criticism. And I don't believe you're the kind of person that doesn't give him not, the same yeah, kind of criticism. It's not without criticism. I you think, know, look, and, I, and you yes. haven't made that criticism. I think if there's one criticism or one observation is that the president, in coming here, right, has still thought, at least in the beginning of his administration, that it's about personalities. And if I can change this personality or if I can get this guy on my side, I can do that. And it's not what the institutional logic is. I think some of that was with the, the FBI and others in the State Department and how his foreign policy is playing out. But I believe you're going to see over time, he's going to have a greater appreciation that this is a city of institutions, and you must engage them as institutions, not just as persons. Does that mean he'll be more? Bingo. And I got to tell you, my sense was, as I'm watching this interview, I'm like, what an asset. What an asset. And having him essentially leave the White House, I think is going to be a big blow to Trump. It's almost like his right arm was cut off. Uh, because he's dead on. In fact, listen to him. Tell Charlie Rose. Charlie Rose like, well, how dare he go on Twitter? And, and, and Bannon is brilliant, saying, look, so what? Because you guys don't deem it appropriate what he says on Twitter? All of a sudden now the president should go on Twitter? And listen to Charlie Rose saying, but it's not in the president's best interest. Listen to Bannon's brilliant combative response. I think what he does on Twitter is extraordinary. He disintermediates the media. He goes above their head and talks directly to the American people. It's not the, a question the, of going over the head of the Amer over the head of the media. It's what he says. It's, it's what he says. No, it's what he says that and, you and deem it, that, that the mainstream no, media, no, no, not the pro clutching, media. the pro clutching mainstream media, yeah. the pro clutching mainstream media, what they deem is not correct. What they deem is not right. No, it's not a question of being right or not right. It's a question of appropriate. It's not a question of appropriateness. It's what you it's deem a, is It's a question of whether it's in his interest. That's the point. I think not the appropriateness think, of okay, it. Okay, I don't so, think he needs. I don't think he needs the Washington Post and the New York Times and CBS News. And I don't believe he thinks that they're looking out for what's in his best interest. Okay, he's not going to believe that. I don't believe that, and you don't believe that. Okay, he destroyed him. He's completely right. Yeah, right, Charlie. Like you have Trump's best interests in mind, get lost. The New York Times, you have Trump's best interests in mind, get lost. The Washington Post, you have Trump's interests in, Trump's interests in mind, get lost. The guy is a street fighter. He's a brawler. 
He uh, he's a no holes barred. Just give it to him with both barrels. He's a guy you want in your corner. The more I saw of the interview, the more I kept saying, "Oh my God, bring him back." Carlos Hernandez, you're up next. Go ahead, Carlos. Hey, Jeff. How you doing today? Good. How are you? Pretty good. Uh, <laughs> Jeff, I mean, uh, look, I've supported uh, Trump from day one. I mean, actually, I knew about Trump for quite some time. In regards to it, uh, I understand where he's going. I mean, uh, <laughs> I, I understand exactly what in the world we're going to have to do to actually try to drain this damn swamp. Because, uh I, I am tired of, uh, I am running for office, as you uh, already know. I am running for Congress against Seth Moulton. Look, I've already been called a racist. Just because I'm fighting for what's right for America and the country and our state. Uh, uh, because actually, I don't want to be, I don't want our state to be a century state. And I went, I was interviewed by some reporter who basically asked me if I was a racist. Uh, but the thing is, they don't realize I'm a guy that fights back too. And immediately I told them, I asked them, are uh, you a racist? Why in the world are you asking me that dumb question? The interview ended, by the way. <laughs> Carlos, when you hear Bannon, what was your reaction when you saw that 60 Minutes interview? Were you like he, me thinking, boy, he should go right back into that White House? He's doing the right thing. I think one of the reasons he got out of, the, uh, he got out of there is mainly because he needs to help Trump to actually uh, accomplish what he wants to accomplish. Because in regards to it, he is fighting he, he basically, the change have been unleashed for him to be able to fight for what Trump is trying to do. Now, the Republican Party right now, not just the Republican, the whole establishment, the, uh, uh, the deep state is basically trying to destroy everything that Trump is trying to do. And, and this has got to stop. Our nation's in trouble. If we don't get, uh, basically, what Trump starts being able to do and trying to, uh, to actually bring our country back to what we were founded on, we're in trouble. We're done. We're cooked. Carlos, we're Carlos, thank you very much for that call. So what you're saying is you think he's going to be more effective on the outside than on the inside. Well, I just got to tell you this. He destroyed Charlie Rose. Ay, yi yi. He took him apart. Coming up next, does the Catholic Church have an economic interest in unlimited illegal immigration? Bannon says yes. And the church goes ballistic. Don't touch that dial. WRKO, the voice of Boston. The media news, I think, is pretty accurate. I'm a street fighter. That's what I mean. You're more than that. No, I think I'm. A, I think I'm. A, I'm, a, I'm a, a street fighter. And by the way, I think that's why Donald Trump and I get along so well. Donald Trump's a fighter. Great counterpuncher. Great counterpuncher. He's a fighter. I'm going to be his wingman outside for the entire time. 137 here on the great WRKO. Okay, in many ways a remarkable interview. Steve Bannon, the first television interview he has ever given uh, regarding politics. Uh, it was to CBS's 60 Minutes, Charlie Rose, and he gave it to him with both barrels. And so one of the most controversial comments that Bannon made, which elicited a fierce response from Cardinal, uh, from Cardinal Dolan, from the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops, from the Catholic Church hierarchy, was when on DACA, Steve Bannon said this. Can I remind you, a good Catholic, that Cardinal Dolan is opposed to what's happening with DACA. Cardinal Dolan. The Catholic Church has been terrible about this. Okay, the, the bishops have been terrible about this. By the way, you know why? You know why? Because unable to really to, 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 to come to grips with the problems in the church, they need illegal aliens. They need illegal aliens to fill the churches. That's, it's obvious on the face of it. That's what, that's what the entire Catholic bishops condemning. They have an economic interest. They have an economic interest in unlimited immigration, unlimited illegal immigration. As much as Boy, I respect, that's a tough thing to say about your church. As much as I respect Cardinal Dolan and the bishops on doctrine, this is not doctrine. This is not doctrine at all. Let me I, talk. I, I totally respect the Pope and I totally respect the Catholic bishops and cardinals on doctrine. This is not about doctrine. This is about the sovereignty of a nation. And in that regard, they're just another guy with an opinion. He's dead on. He's dead on. As a devout Catholic, I'm telling you, uh, on doctrine, what he just said now, is he's a thousand percent correct. Now, 
a couple of things need to be said, and then I want to open it up to the phone lines to you in Cooner Country. 617-266-6868 if you want to jump on. Uh, is Bannon correct? Is he right? Does the Catholic Church have an economic interest in unlimited illegal immigration? In fact, it's the poll question of the day, sponsored by Bill Kelly Financial Services. If you believe the answer is yes, and honestly, I believe it's it's obvious, like the sky is blue, the answer is yes, text the letter A to 680680. If you believe the answer is no, Dolan said, in fact, his comments were preposterous, insulting, not even worth a rebuttal then text the letter B to 680680. As always, you can vote online at WRKO.com. Now, a couple things to me need to be said right off the bat. Notice that Charlie Rose or anybody else in the media, I don't care, Larry King, Brian Williams, uh, softball on softball, Chris Matthews, the silver-haired guy, Anderson Cooper, Wolf Blitzer, it doesn't matter. When it comes to the issue of illegal immigration, all of a sudden now, There's no separation of church and state. All of a sudden now. But Cardinal Dolan, Cardinal Dolan says you're just wrong on this. Cardinal Dolan, like like he's the last authority now on this issue. Notice, they never ask a liberal or a Democrat. You know, you're pro. They never ask, let's say, John Kerry, just for the sake of argument, Jean Francois. You know, you're pro abortion. Cardinal Dolan says you're in violation of Catholic doctrine. Notice, they never ask liberals or Democrats about their positions on same-sex marriage or abortion, which, by the way, are fundamental to Catholic doctrine. I mean, that's just a fact. I mean, I'm not whether you agree or disagree, it doesn't matter. I, the Catholic catechism teaches that abortion is murder and immoral. The Catholic Catechism teaches that marriage is between a man and a woman. Again, agree, disagree, you don't like it, go to another church. But that's the fundamental teaching of the Catholic Church. Notice, the media never holds Democrats accountable on those issues. They never say, to Nancy the Piranha Pelosi, you know, your church, Cardinal Dolan, uh, you're, you're in violation of church doctrine on abortion and same-sex marriage, Nancy. Do you know that? They never even once ask him that question. Okay? But let that go. Let that go. Now, as to the issue itself, Catholic doctrine says nothing about illegal immigration. Nothing. In fact, Dolan himself had to cite the Old Testament and the New Testament, but he couldn't cite the Catholic catechism. Why? Because it's not official church doctrine. Bannon on this is a thousand percent correct. They're just another guy with an opinion. On moral and spiritual, theological matters, yes, the Pope is absolute. That's what Catholics believe. But on anything else, it's just another opinion. Take it seriously, look at it, weigh it, consider it, but you're not a bad Catholic if you disagree with the Pope on immigration. But you are a bad Catholic. If you go against the church on abortion or family or marriage or run down the line. Okay, but, but even more than that, let me address this now as a Catholic. Steve Bannon is a thousand percent correct. Why is Catholic charities taking hundreds of millions of dollars in federal government money to help uh, resettle refugees and uh, and all kinds of other migrants all across the United States. It's not just them. I know they're Protestant groups, others. But I'm talking about Catholic charities for the money. Furthermore, everybody knows in the South and in the West in particular, in the United States, Catholic Church, the pews are emptying out. The only thing filling them up are Latinos, especially illegals from Mexico and Latin and South America. You take away the illegal immigrant population and the Catholic Church is nothing in the South and in the West. The only way to keep their pews filled is to make sure that illegal immigration keeps rolling in. That keeps the pews filled up, that keeps the churches full, And that keeps the money and the donations rolling in. It's as clear as day. Now, finally, and I think the mother of all points, 
what would Jesus do? Okay, This is essentially the argument of Cardinal Dolan. When you cite the scriptures, but Jesus took in the, um, the foreigner. Jesus took in the poor. Jesus clothed those that were naked, fed the hungry, gave shelter to those who were homeless. So look at what Jesus did. So if you have to follow Jesus, then you have to take in the illegals, i.e. you have to take in DACA. Whoa, 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 whoa. Whoa, 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 whoa. Number one, I'm not the one with the 40-foot high wall. That's the Vatican. That's, forgive me, that's you. Do unto others as you would have done unto you. That's the golden rule. Pope Francis in St. Peter's Square, Vatican City, sits behind a 40-foot wall. So why is it okay for him to have a massive wall? And why is it okay for St. Peter's and Vatican City to not take in millions and millions of illegals? But you want every American to do that? You want America to do that? That's hypocrisy. But it's also something else. Yes, let me be very candid with you. I really, I'm speaking now from the heart, okay? I give a lot of money to charity. I shouldn't be saying this. My wife gets mad. I always reveal all my personal affairs on the air. I give a lot of money to charity. I um, sponsor children in Africa. By the grace of God, there go I. I do believe we have a moral obligation. I really mean this, to clothe the naked, uh, shelter the homeless, and feed the hungry. I really do. As a Catholic and as a Christian, I really believe that. I don't want to round up illegals in concentration camps. I think we should treat them with compassion. But we're going to send them home. And I'll tell you why. I, you know, Yes, give them a meal and send them back. I'm not saying let them die in the desert. Take care of them, but send them back. Why? Because Jesus would not be in favor of hiding behind a locked door while unleashing political and economic misery upon his fellow men. And that's what illegal immigration does. Because you see, what the Catholic Church is deliberately leaving out is that it's not just take in the stranger and clothe the stranger and feed the stranger. No, 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 no. It's bring in people into a country who steal the jobs of Americans, who drive down the wages, especially of the working poor, who take the welfare benefits away, again, from those who truly need it in America, who come into our classrooms, and because we have to take care of so many illegal immigrant children, our children cannot get a proper education because they can't even speak basic English. And never mind the rapists, and never mind the gangbangers, and never mind the murderers, and never mind MS-13, and never mind the human and drug traffickers. In other words, I'm sorry, but my faith doesn't teach me to commit suicide. My faith doesn't say, welcome the murderer into my home. Welcome the rapist into my home. Allow me to bring in a stranger who then imposes a massive burden upon my children so they can't get an education or they can't get a job or the working poor can't be able to get uh, 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 feed their family because they're driving wages down. You see, that Jesus would not say yes to. He wouldn't. He didn't. So what they're doing is they're perverting the message of Christ to justify social justice. And in the eyes of Timothy Dolan, and I think now there's no getting around it, this is the fundamental clash. And I'm openly challenging him and Cardinal Sean O'Malley and the liberal wing of the Catholic Church. Are you an American first or are you not? Because what you are saying in your response to Bannon is that it's our duty to bring in all the illegal immigrants and support DACA and support amnesty, is what you're saying is that social justice trumps the Constitution. And I'm sorry, it doesn't. The Constitution and the sovereignty of the United States trumps social justice, it trumps globalism, it trumps liberalism, it trumps amnesty for illegal immigrants. It does. We are a nation based on the rule of law. And so what I would ask Dolan is this. Do you believe in our constitutional republic? 
It's a very simple answer. What's your religion, sir? Because if you don't, then I'm very sorry. But that's the definition of a Benedict Arnold. We have laws in this country. And those laws are there to protect the citizens and legal immigrants of the United States of America. We're not a one-world government. And let me say one final thing. And I know I'm really up against it because Brittany's yelling break in my ear, but I want to say this. I heard a sermon in my own church three four weeks ago. Again, again, lecturing us on racism. We have to change Yawkey way. We have to rename things. Uh, we have to be open to illegal immigrants. I don't want, as a Catholic, to be forced to break the law. I don't want, as a Christian, to be opposed to the lawful rules and the laws of my own country. And I want to say something else to all the priests that are potentially listening to this. You always lecture us, always, to be faithful, to follow the faith. Why don't you follow the faith? You keep asking us to live the faith. Why don't you live the faith? Because I have been here in Massachusetts now for five years. In, and I go to church almost every Sunday. I have never heard one priest denounce abortion from the pulpit. In five freaking years, I haven't heard one. How come you don't live the faith on abortion? How come you don't live the faith on homosexuality? How come you don't live the faith on same-sex marriage? How come you don't live the faith on pornography? How come all of a sudden, when it comes to living the faith, I don't see you, but you ask us to live the faith? No, 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 no. Why don't you condemn abortion and condemn same-sex marriage and uphold the dignity of the family as the Catholic Church and Catholic doctrine fundamentally teaches you and instructs you to do. Instead, every Sunday, it's like an op-ed from the Boston Globe. And so my question to the Catholic Church and to Timothy Dolan, very simple. Are you a Catholic first or are you a liberal first? I'm a Catholic first. What's your decision? Rich in Pepperell. Go ahead, Rich. Jeff, great show today. Jeff, the Thank last you. time you and I spoke was in the parking lot behind Riviera College. I bumped into you before the John Bolton yes! uh, hall meeting. Yes, Rich. Yeah. How are you, my friend? <laughs> I'm good. I've got a couple of quick points to make Go before ahead. we talk about the Catholic Church. First, we are very, very lucky that the, uh, that the uh, folks in the mainstream media didn't release the Billy Bush tape closer to the date of the election. Because I think uh, we may not have uh, won the election had that been the case, but thank God they didn't release it. Thank God they released it when they did. The second point that I want to make before I talk about the Catholic Church is I think that President Bush, the great deal maker, should be using term limits uh, as a greater uh, uh, means of leverage against dra uh, for draining the swamp. Um, Hold on, Rich. You mean, you mean Trump? Trump. Oh, sorry, okay, you said President Bush. Okay, no, go ahead. Okay, Trump is the great deal maker, should be pushing yes. term limits. I agree with you. Yes, yes. I think that if he pushes term limits and he uses that as leverage, I think that will solve 80, 80 to 90 percent of the problems with the swamp. I mean, if, if we'd had term limits, we wouldn't have Ted Kennedy, Robert Byrd, Mitch McConnell, or, or Paul Ryan. And in regard to the Catholic Church, uh, let's face it, I mean, they are a business. I am a Catholic. But isn't it convenient how the mainstream media always uses the Catholic Church to their advantage to serve its own liberal agenda? Bingo. Bingo. That's what I said. They never cite the catechism or doctrine on abortion or marriage or take your issue. But on illegal immigration, all of a sudden, Cardinal Dolan disagrees with you. Cardinal Dolan. Jim in Weymouth. Go ahead, Jim. Hey, great to talk to you again. Hi, Jim. Uh, yeah, yeah, I've got Jim, you got to get a, your phone. Your your connection is bad. Brenda in Beverly, go ahead, Brenda. I'm glad that you brought this up, Jeff. The um, 
the church, sadly, the Catholic Church, and I hate to always, like, sort of jab the Catholic Church because I like to talk to the church in the entirety, but they are certainly an arm of the Democratic Party. I mean, they clearly are going by the mantra, which is actually biblical, and I just don't know where it is at the moment in the New Testament. Do as I say, not as I do. And I like to always say, uh, there's another scripture which I love, which is, uh, your whitewashed tombs full of dead man's bones. And you know what? We never hear anything in the pulpit, Jeff. Uh, I should say, I shouldn't say not every, every, uh, church is like this. But there's less talk about Jesus. There's all this talk about social justice. I like to hear them talk about what Mary said when he was turning the water to wine, when she said, whatever he says, meaning Jesus, do it. They don't talk like that. It's all this social justice baloney, and I'm tired of it, just like you, Jeff. Thank you. I mean, amen, Brenda. I mean, I, I'm, to me, I should just go, just read the Boston Globe. I mean, guys, really, if you're going to be that liberal, just read the Boston Globe. Okay, coming up next... 16th anniversary of the 9-11 attacks. Are we losing or winning the war on terror? The voice of Boston is you. 680 WRKO Boston, 93.7 WEEI HD2 Lawrence Boston. It's 2 o'clock.